All right, so this is our project so far. We've written some text. We've added a little bit of graphics. If you didn't get the name to appear below the graphic, the way that I did it was, just like on line 13, I added a break at the end of the line. Well, on line 14, at the end of that image code, I added a break. And then on the next line, I added my name. So all of those three lines actually are part of the same unit, this paragraph. And I needed to then divide it into the next line with break. Let's say that next I want to add the big breakthrough of HTML, was, which was the hypertext, one document linked to another document. So let's say on this next line, on line 16, let's press enter, and then we will write this hr tag. HR. Save it and run it, and then explain to me, what does the hr tag do? HR. It does not have a pair. HR. Save it and run it, and what you should get is a horizontal rule, a line. You get a line. HR. Now, I'm, ex I'm writing all of this code, and I'm explaining it to you, and you're taking notes. That's great. Let me say, we can take notes inside of our code as well. We can add comments to our code. This is, this is going to be text inside of our code that, that the web browser ignores. It doesn't process that code. It's, it's known as comments. We can add comments to our code. Comments are great to explain to myself, what did this code do? Because I might work on a project now and come back a month later and forget what it all does. If I write comments to myself, I'm helping myself. If I'm working in a team, I can leave a comment to say, hey, don't forget to fix this. So comments, uh, very valuable. And so to write an HTML comment, let's say I'm going to write it right here on line 17. I'm going to explain to myself what that HR tag means, because I might forget. Horizontal rule. So space there. And then I'm going to write again the angle brackets, as always. But here's how it's going to differ a lot. I'm going to write the exclamation point dash dash, see how that turned green, you're going to add a space and then dash dash. Between these two tags here is a comment, therefore ignored by the web browser. And I can write anything I want here, the web browser ignores it. Don't write this. But this is a comment. The web browser will ignore this. Between these funny angle brackets, be between these uh, funny tags, this is one of the most unique tags you'll, you'll ever see. It has a pair, but notice it doesn't end with a slash exclamation point. If you try to put in a slash exclamation point, it'll break, actually. I think. Yeah, it does. Because notice these two things are commented out. So now it actually deactivated that code. So the angle the ending tag of the coat of the comment is, is like this. It has to be like this. Angle bracket, exclamation point, dash, dash. No spaces here. Space, whatever you want. Space, dash, dash, angle bracket. That's a comment. And so here, then, I can write the comment that says, this draws a line. Horizontal rule. Roller. And even if I wrote valid code here, it would be ignored. Any valid HTML code that's within a comment is ignored. As we'll go on, we'll see sometimes we need to deactivate code in order to test things. So instead of deleting the code or cutting it out of this document and putting it into another, 
we can deactivate the code via a comment. We just wrap the comment tags around it. So that is a comment. And the comments can be single line or multi line. Let's do this. Let's go to the end where we've got the HTML tag, but give yourself a brand new line 19. Again, if your lines don't line up with me, that's okay. But find right before your, your slash HTML tag ends, give yourself a new line before that. And we'll, we'll add the, the comment tag again. But this time, I'm going to break it up into two lines. Start the tag, and the tag. And in the middle, I can write whatever I want. Lots of stuff here, lots of stuff here, lots of stuff here, on and on and on. So that same tag, I can break into multiple lines to do multi-line comment. So for example, I have a little section here that gives myself some credit or whatever you want, and that's all ignored by the web browser. You can save it and run it, and you should see that none of this shows up on screen. If it does, make sure you wrote the tags properly. Those tabs are totally optional. You often see when people want to write their code pretty, they add tabs and all of that to kind of make it look nice. So that's a comment, comment tag. When we get to these other languages that we'll learn, because we're going to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, once we get to the CSS language, it has also comments, and JavaScript has comments. And comments are useful to make notes and also to deactivate our code, as we'll see later. Any questions? Okay, let's go back and give yourself a new line 18, a new line before the end of body. We're going to create the paragraph tag again, a new unit of content here, a new section. Think about it in terms of the syllabus. This is a paragraph here. It's got various lines, course information, a bunch of stuff, course description, that's another paragraph, course objective, another paragraph. So each of these like little sections, I can mark them as paragraphs. But we've got a new section here, paragraph. Uh, we're going to say here... visit the instructor's GitHub repo. Raise your hand. How many of you have heard of GitHub? How many of you have heard of Git? Okay. GitHub is a free website. GitHub.com is a free website where you can upload your code. You can upload, upload your code there, keep it safe, and it, you can make copies of your code, work on your code, give other people access to your code so they can help you work on your code and all of that. So I have a GitHub account. I've got a few projects up there that you can play with if you'd like. But what I want to do is make, make this so that if someone clicks on the, the words there, it then goes to that website. I want that to be a hyperlink. I want that to be hypertext, HTML. 
I want to mark that this is a hypertext link. So I want the words GitHub repo repository. GitHub repo. I want that to be clickable so that it goes to my web address. So this is going to be marked with a tag and if you want to link from this document to another document, obviously you use the a tag. Well, you might have been thinking I was going to say the link tag. But no, when they were inventing HTML, the link tag doesn't make a link. The A tag makes a link. Because it is an anchor in this document to another document. But it's a link. The A tag will create a link from this document to another document on that text. So if I want to go over to the to the Facebook website, what do I need? The Facebook URL, the Facebook address. So I'm going to need a URL, an address, to make that an active link. So this does have a pair, a tag, a slash a, but it also has properties. We need to back up into the a tag and then say what is the address that this links to, the URL. Or the URI. So this will be href, hypertext reference. So some of these things you don't need to know what they mean or stand for, but it's but it's important for you to know what they do. Just like these other properties, source equals quote end quote, href equals quote end quote, car set equals quote end quote. They all have that sort of syntax where it's a tag and it might have a property and an, and an attribute. So within these quotes, we need the web address. And because it's on the web, we need the HTTP colon slash slash part. We need the protocol. We need to say this is on the web. If we only typed victor.com, for example, it might not work. It might think that we mean, oh, victor.com, the graphic in this folder. We need to type the protocol, the, the address here, to tell us it's on the web. HTTP colon slash slash. Remember, those are not backslashes. If people tell you backslash, it means this, which is wrong. Slashes. G-I-T H-U-B GitHub dot com slash V-M-C-A-M-P-O-S. So if this worked, if we save it and run it, what should happen is that the GitHub repo text is an active link. And if you click on it, it should go to my GitHub address right here, my GitHub repo. Oh, VM Campos, yes. <coughs> Let's try that. Save it and run it in the browser. Visit the instructor's GitHub repo. You should see that it's blue. It's underlined like a classic link. You put your mouse on top of it and the cursor changes to the finger or the hand to tell you it's a link. So it looks like a link so far. If you click on it, it will go to github.com, my profile there. Some of my projects that you can look at the code and play with. <coughs> And so we created a hypertext link, the HT and HTML. We've marked this to be an active link, an anchor, and it's linked there to that web resource. Did that work for everyone? Did you go to the wrong Victor's address? It's VM Campos. So if you followed that link, maybe you, maybe you, um, you went to my profile, maybe you looked around, maybe you clicked on one of these projects, what's VMC Drinks, you go over here, you click on something else, 
well, I want to get back to my project that I've been working on, and I might have clicked 10 times, so I'd have to press back 10 times. So let's go back to our code and instead edit our code a little bit more. We've told the web browser this is our address, but I want it to open in a new, a new window or a new tab. Now, you, you often see that, don't you? You open content in a new tab, and that's what I want here. I want this to open in a different tab. Someone can look at my GitHub profile, then they can close that tab, and they're still on this project. If we don't add that, the default is that we then follow the trail of links, and then if someone closes the GitHub page, they've closed my page as well. And then they probably won't go back to it because we have such short attention spans. But if we add one more property here, we'll make this open in its own tab. So after the href property, add another space there. I'm still inside of the angle brackets. Notice where the purple is. Inside here, inside here. We have a property called target equals quotes, which means open, close, end quote. Open quote, end quote. And inside of those quotes, this attribute here is underscore blank. And that basically means when someone clicks on this link, open it in a blank window or blank tab. It's going to depend on the web browser. Some web browsers will open it in a brand new window. Most web browsers nowadays will open it in a new tab. Remember the old days, those pop-up windows that would appear all the time? Well, the web browsers nowadays themselves don't open tabs like they used to. They're still around, of course. but uh, Or don't open windows. Now they open tabs. But try that. Make sure that's all spelled properly. Notice target is red. If it was misspelled, it might have been the wrong color. So red doesn't mean wrong. It just means this is, the, this is that particular HTML code, href. Oops, I didn't spell target right. Once we get more complex, and you call me over for help, I'm going to be looking right away, what's your color coding looking like? And I'm going to see here, that should be red. Oops, misspelled. So if you click it, at the top what happened was it opened a brand new tab, Someone can visit a bunch of links here. They close that tab. They're still on my project. So the very first websites in the early 90s um, they were basically just text and links and then eventually graphics and then sound and then animation and videos and now the modern web YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, your company's website, all of that. And that's all still coming from basic HTML usually. And the default nowadays is black text on a white background just like paper. This is very readable black ink on a white background, on white paper. Very readable. But in the real world, look at this, I've got black ink on yellow paper. We can do the same thing um, on websites. So what we've done so far is we've, we've written a basic website. It's got, the, it's got the basic structure and a few tags and it does a few things. But it, it's functional, but it might look boring. I want to talk a little bit about now adding some color. Um, we can do other cool things like drop shadows, so some visual, uh, some visual interest. Everything that we've written so far has been HTML, HTML5 compliant code. And as I said, our web app and then our 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 Android app is going to have three pillars: HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML for the structure and the content, and CSS for the style, 
the design of it, the look and feel, and then um, JavaScript for the interactivity. So I've written the HTML for the structure and the content. Now I want to write a little CSS for the style. CSS is the is what will allow us to put a yellow background, which will allow us to make a larger font, which will let us change the font, which will let us add a drop shadow to that picture, um, which will let us position things on the screen. I want this picture to be in the middle of the screen instead of the left. So the design, the look and feel, all of the visual interest of the project will be through CSS. So HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, and now we'll write some CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. You can make a note somewhere, maybe down here. HTML, Hypertext Language, Structure and Content, CSS, Cascading style sheets, which is design and presentation. JavaScript doesn't stand for anything, but it's the um, interactivity. So when you click a button, it plays a sound. When you drag an element, it saves it in a database. When you click the button on your, on your Android app, it takes a photo. The interactivity, JavaScript. You will be able to get to all three of these in the first month. And so if you want to get really impressive, we'll say we're using HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, uh, we'll say EC5. Just which version of it. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about CSS. I want to add a little bit of visual interest to my project. It's boring black and white. So there's many ways to write HTML, many ways to write CSS, many ways to write JavaScript to get to the same result. There's no right or wrong answer. There's just different ways to accomplish the same task. So right now I'll show one of the most basic ways, which I would usually avoid, but I'm just going to show you this way for us to see how it works. Then we'll get more complex later. I want to add a background color. Instead of boring white background, let's add some other cool color. Let's back up to the body tag. All of these tags have a built-in style. The text is automatically black, the background is automatically white, everything is automatically to the left. There's defaults. We're going to override those defaults. First of all, I'm going to say I don't want to have a plain white background, and the background is defined by the body. So what I'm going to do here is add some new style, styling. I'm going to add some new CSS to alter the default look of body. So it's going to be similar in and that what we did here was we added a property and then added a value and changed it, changed image. We're going to change body. And to write the CSS, it's always in this format. Inside of the body tag there, we'll write style equals quote, end quote. And what we're doing here is we're writing inline style. I'm going to write a note here. inline style or inline CSS. 
we're writing some CSS specifically to this particular HTML. And it'll work for us, and if you've never done this before, this will be amazing. But as we go a little bit further, this is not quite the best way to do it. I'm going to show you a variety of ways. This is one of the most direct ways to see how this works. I'm going to change the style of the body specifically, so inside the quotes, specifically I'm going to change the background dash color. So background dash color. Make sure there's a dash between those two words. Background dash color. Colon, which is shift semicolon, which is next to the L. Colon, space. Now we can pick a color. Red, semicolon. So this is our syntax. Style equals quote, end quote. We always do that. Then, well, what property are we affecting or changing or altering a body? The background color, colon. There's always a colon after what sort of um, uh, property we're trying to change here. Space. Well, how are we changing it? We're saying the background color is red. Semicolon. We're done with that statement because we can have more. Semicolon. Semicolon there, colon there. Save it and run it. And let's see a lovely shade of red. Uh, blanket our document. Question? Do you have to put anything like style equals CSS or something like that? Mm -hmm. No. Here we're saying, um, because it's modern HTML5, um, it is basically assumed that this style <coughs> means CSS. So we don't have to specifically say it's CSS. Style means CSS. So if I save it and run it, my eyes are hurting. Here we go, red. Well, if you don't like red, what about blue? Instead of red, blue. If you don't like blue, try yellow, try green, try pink. Try different colors. Can you find a, can you find an interesting color? Purple. There's purple. Gold. Does gold work? Doesn't shine, but there's gold. If gold works, is there silver? Again, it doesn't shine, but there's silver. Oh, is there platinum? No. If there's a value that doesn't work, it'll just go back to default because it doesn't understand it. And guess what? Over on that W3 website, there's a list of all possible colors. W3schools.com, references, HTML, HTML color reference. There's 140 colors we can choose from with names such as dark red, goldenrod, ivory, khaki, light salmon, linen, pretty dirty linen, lime, lime green, medium turquoise, etc., etc., etc. 140, uh, 140 colors to choose from, like white smoke. There's 140 reserved names, like tomato, that you can use. But maybe my company's color is not really any of these shades of red. So we can also here add a color in a variety of other methods. We can add it as a as a color name entity like that, but if you have any experience in Photoshop or any graphic software, you can get a color formula, and we have different ways to display a color formula, such as RGB, open close parentheses, 200, 0, 0. Try that. Save it and run it. 
what kind of color is that? RGB, open close parentheses, right. 200 comma 0 comma 0. Do you ever go to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever and you need house paint? You tell them, I want yellow for this room. And they'll say, well, take your pick. We've got 40 yellows. So they mix a color formula. A little bit of this base color, a little bit of that base color, and then you've got your perfect yellow. Canary yellow. Morning light canary yellow. So here we can mix red, green, and blue values. R, G, V. A little red, a little green, a little blue, and you get a color. And it goes from zero to 255. So if I increase this value up to 250, let's say, notice it got brighter. That was 200, that was 250, Okay, what about if I go down to 100? It's getting darker. So if you go all the way down to zero, you get black. So this is the color formula for black. And when people first learn web design, they want to learn how to make a cool black background. And there you go. But then your text is invisible. So we can mix color formulas here. Let's say a little bit of red, a medium amount of blue, and a little bit of green. It's green, a version of green. So we've got color formula. Now let's say you've chosen a dark color, it's a nice color, but then the problem is that our text might get lost, especially here on my projector. My screen looks okay, but on the projector you can't read any of the text. So one concept we have to have is that we, we often have a foreground and a background element. Right now we've been editing the background. We've edited the background color, and therefore we've got this dark color. We often want to have contrast, a good uh, good design is choosing oftentimes good contrast. So I've got this printout, for example. You might not be able to read it, but from a distance, it looks readable. I see this text on that background, I see this text on that background, this text on that background. And over here, they've chosen a, a white color on a green background. The green is a little dark, but the text is white. Over here, you've got white on yellow. It's pretty well designed. It's readable. And then you've got the ultimate readability, black on white. So foreground, background. The text is the foreground, the background is the background. So you want to think in terms of opposites. If you've got your background dark, you don't want your foreground dark also. That's what I've got there. Dark background, dark foreground. No readability. But if I've got dark background, light foreground, readability. The default was light background, dark foreground. White, uh, black on white. Here I've got black on green, hard to read. So if you've chosen a dark background color, now I want to contrast that with a light text color. So back to CSS. I've said here, I've changed the background color to some dark color. After that semicolon, still inside of the quotes, still inside of the angle brackets, I want to edit another property. I want to edit something else about the body. I edited background color, so it would make perfect sense to then edit text-color. That would make perfect sense, but unfortunately that's not what you write. When they were inventing CSS in 1998, no one had the good idea to, to call this thing text color. They called it color. Color means text color. Background-color means the background color. What color means your text color? So it's not text dash color, it's color. And let's say there I write white semicolon. Don't forget that ending semicolon. Because this is a list. 
change my background color and change my text color and change my link color and change the size of my text and etc 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 separated with semicolons you see here this property and this value background property with a value of green text color property with a value of white my result is contrast readability one of the basics of design one of the concepts of design background forward background foreground relationship light foreground dark background or vice versa I could have green text on the white background and that would also be readable but it's opposites <coughs> So the, because this is a full-featured class, we'll be talking about all of these aspects, not just coding. Later on, we'll be talking about creating an app's icon uh, and logo and creating a store listing. So we'll get into some of these artistic aspects of things. And a lot of us that come to this class are very comfortable um, in this side of things, the, the code side. We can handle this. But then when it's time to load up Photoshop or something like that, well, I can't even draw a straight line. But if you're going to be an app developer, probably you'll have to deal with all aspects of it, especially if you're the only person on the app development team. You're going to have to deal with the code and the graphics and the design and all of that. So we will be covering all of that stuff as time goes on. But uh, let's do a little more CSS here. We can also target different parts of the document. Right now, everything got green background white text or whatever you chose. Let's do this. Let's go to our heading number one tag and to the heading number one we can also add inline style. So style added to the heading one. We'll do the same thing. Background color, text color, color. Choose any other colors. Background Dash color colon. I'm just going to go with simple color names. I'll go with um, uh, brown space color gold. Still kind of thinking in terms of dark and light contrasts. So I know gold is a light color, brown is a dark color, pretty good contrast. What if I did brown, background, crimson, foreground? Mm, losing contrast, not as readable. And so notice what happened, we were able to add inline style to that one element, the heading one element, and it put a background color just behind that text, actually all the way to the end, but just on that one element. <clears throat> I'll do the same thing to the heading two. Another color, um, azure or azure, color uh, olive, so here we're getting a little glimpse that we can use CSS, it's not gonna, it's not gonna literally say CSS here, it's style, cascading style sheets. I'll explain what it actually means in a bit. But the result of using CSS is that we are changing the default design, the default style of our code. That's the purpose of CSS. But it's not just to change some colors. We can also do other things with CSS. For example, um, in the old days, I wanted to put a background color 
behind some element of text, let's say, I would then need to use maybe Photoshop to design it. And then maybe then the boss said, actually put a little bit more edge on that color. So you go back to Photoshop, you add some more pixels, you save it again, and then you upload it, and the boss changes their mind again, actually take away a few pixels, so you have to keep editing it. Well, with CSS, we can edit some of those things as well. So let's go on further here. Um, I want to add a little bit of extra space. Notice how this D is very close to the edge of that color. It doesn't have any breathing room. I want to add a little bit of extra space between the text and the background color. So there's a couple of ways to affect that, but the way we'll do this is after this color, we'll add another property here, and this one is going to be padding. P-A-D-D-I-N-G, padding, colon. And not only can we choose colors, but we can also choose dimensions of things. So I'm going to say here, let's try 25px, semicolon. There's no space between the, the, the value and the unit. I'm saying 25 pixels. If I don't know what a pixel is, just save it and run it and see the result. A pixel is basically a dot on your screen. We have different units, inches, pixels, centimeters, percent, etc. We have different units to define things on the screen. And here I've said 25 pixels. And I've put 25 pixels on the four edges of this box. Um, CSS operates with the box model, that basically everything on screen is in an, in an invisible box. Everything is in an invisible box. But we didn't see it until we added a background color. And then we see that the box is extended all the way till the end of the screen. So there's the box model. There's four edges, always. Even if there's something round, even if there's something curly, there's always going to be four edges. It's in a box. And so what I've said here is to add padding to those four edges. So we've got 25 pixels on the top, on the bottom and the left and the right, but the default behavior is to go all the way to the right so it doesn't really show up there. But we've added 25 pixels of padding, and so that pushed the text a little bit away from the edge. It gave you some padding right here, and here, and here. We also have another property called margin. Margin. Also add 25px. Save it and run it and see what that does. Tell me the difference between padding and margin, if you can. <laughs> margin. Now remember to be adding semicolons in between each property and a colon in between the, the name and the value. So what would you say margin does contrasting with padding? Padding gives you a little space inside of the invisible box. And margin gives you space outside of the box. So it gave me 25 pixels of space on the left, on the top, on the right, and the bottom. You should see that the that the color on the right doesn't go all the way to the right anymore. There's 25 pixels there. And it doesn't start all the way to the left anymore because there's 25 pixels there. To make it obvious, I'll put 55. 25 on the left, top, right, bottom. It's margin. Did you say the space is optional after coding? I didn't say that, but it actually is. Um, right there, that, that space is optional, but I usually add it just to be able to read it. And then even technically, you know, that's, that space is optional and that space, all of that's optional. But then it gets kind of hard to read. Are there any non-optional spaces? <coughs> we, will, we will see examples of non-optional spaces 
uh, for example, uh, if we added a space there, that would not work. There's some, some case, and over here, I believe, if we add a space between those units, that doesn't work. That's why I did say, make sure there's no space there. So whenever there is something that is quirky, I try to mention it. Usually it's kind of loose. And so here we're kind of taking a little bit of a look at uh, tip of the iceberg to kind of start to work with aligning things. We can use CSS to make columns. You've probably visited a bunch of websites where there's a main area and then on the side there's a column. Well, that'll also work with an app. I could have an app that's on a tablet and then there's a left column with certain icons and then a right column with our main content. That'll be something we get to also with CSS to be able to make columns. So CSS is not just colors but it's about being able to edit fonts and positions and sizes and now it's pretty advanced because we can even do some animation in CSS. We can animate this doing a little flip. You know that it's out of, out of the screen and it flips into the screen. We can do that with CSS. Pretty advanced, CSS3. We'll do one little CSS3 and we're getting close to the end of the day but I want to show you here these these that I've mentioned here, background color, padding, margin, guess what? You can get over to the W3 school site, references, CSS reference, and it'll list here all the several hundred possibilities that you can use. That's why I'm saying, even in 12 weeks, we can't learn all of this. But I'm going to show you something cool that everyone always gasps when we do it. In the old days, if I was going to make a website or an app, I would make this graphic in Photoshop and I wanted rounded corners. I wanted to make a rounded edges to that picture. So I would do that in Photoshop, maybe mask it or whatever, and then I put it in the app and then later on we've, di we've gone through a new style, a new design, and now we want to add more roundness or less roundness, so we have to redesign the graphic whoops, we deleted the original graphic, we have to recreate the graphic. Well, through CSS, specifically the latest, CSS3, we add one simple property, and we can make this graphic round. We can add a drop shadow, we can make it round, we can make it animate, all that cool stuff. So let's say I'm going to make this graphic round. It's a square, but I'll make it round through CSS. So same thing, we can add basically CSS to everything in the project, every tag every tag can have some form of CSS attached to it. So let's add some CSS to the image. And as time goes on, it, I'll explain that it does matter the order of how you add your code. Right now, don't quite worry about it. But I want to add style to my image and kind of following along with what I've already done, I've got the tag and then style, so I'll do the same here the tag, and then style, and then source. Style. So line 14 or so, wherever your image is at, add style. Doesn't quite matter. Sometimes it does, but I'm adding it here just to be consistent to, with my previous code. Style right after the tag. Um, so we'll do style there, and then we've got a, a property that we can look up. This one is called border-radius, colon, and we'll say, just to make it obvious, 55px, semicolon. So our syntax is, technically we have this selector, we're selecting something, the border radius, and the value property, the value, the selector, the value, um, 5px, well, border radius. We don't see how this looks until we see it in the, in the web browser. The web browser translates that HTML code into something that we can read as a human. And when you add border dash radius, circle gets the square. Now my original graphic has some black edges, so it looks a little weird. But yes, it's, it's a round 
It's a round graphic. Yes. Let's say the colors that we have in the background for, let's say, Hello World. Would it be possible to round the edges on that as well, or would you actually allow it to do that? On any of these kinds of ideas, mm -hmm. we can try it. We can see what happens. Short answer is yes, but why not try it? So I've attached the exact same border radius, 25px, to an image and to that text. And I have a rounded background. In the old days, I'd have to design a little rounded corner graphic in Photoshop and make a table and do all of these hacks. And now it's built into CSS3. Round it. Now if you've been doing web design for a while, you'll see that this has been evolving, that in the beginning not every web browser could handle this. The older web browsers would ignore this and keep showing it square. And by old browsers I mean like, you know, Internet Explorer 7 and Firefox version 10 and Chrome version 2 and Safari 3, those ones that haven't been around in 10 years. So um, here we are using the modern CSS code that's working on modern browsers, but yes, yeah, some browsers, some old browsers are still out there. People are still clinging to their Windows XP, and so they might not see rounded corners. But is it is it mission critical for them to see that rounded corner? No, it's a little icing on the cake. It looks nice, but it should still be functional. So if you have a little bit of experience in in this realm of web design and such, you might be asking, what about vendor prefixes? Never mind. If you don't know what a vendor prefix is, never mind. I'm going right here with the most modern version of the code because eventually our project is going to go on one of these, which is often the most cutting edge web browser, rendering engine, and so forth. We have this automatic update that happens on our device every once in a while that we don't even want that happens and it updates us to the latest version of the code and such. And even if you've got like an Android 1.0 device, this stuff will work. Hopefully you don't have an Android 1.0 device. You might have fallen into a wormhole. But what I'm talking about here is just nothing really marks it as CSS3. But that's CSS3. That doesn't work on older web browsers. But I'm not worried about it because I'm looking to the future, to these modern devices. And even if this was not working on someone's old Internet Explorer version 8, that's not going to, you know, that's not mission critical, that it's rounded. So there's still plenty more we can do, but this, I think here at this point, we'll stop for some general questions. But here we've, uh, if you've never done any of this before, again, honestly, congratulate yourself. You're a web designer. You've made a web page, a website. You've got HTML, you've got CSS, we haven't done JavaScript yet. But we've got links, we've got text, we've got colors, we've got a little bit of style. Right here, we're on our way. And eventually, we will get... Eventually, we'll get from here to here. Get from here to here, because all of this is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then that eventually will get to here as a fully functional app with extra features. How many lines of code? This particular one that I have up here right now is 270. <coughs> And uh, we can get more complicated, less complicated, but that's 270 lines of code that makes this whole project work right here. Because as I've said, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. This is based on something called jQuery Mobile. So we'll get to that very quickly. This is still HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but it's a framework. It's like a template, like a starting point. So we won't need to write this basic app every single time. We're going to start with a sort of a template 
and make it work what, how we want it to work. And we can quickly go from 0 to 60, from the crawling to the walking to the running. And by the end of the course, we'll have this fully functioning project, this web app, part month one. Any other general questions? All right, so I'm going to end the main lecture at this point. We'll have a little bit of lab time until 9.30. Usually we end at 9. We'll have a little bit of lab time. Um, this work that we did right here, if you saved it to your USB drive, that's fine. If you didn't, I'm going to... If you, if you didn't save this, if you can't take this with you or didn't bring a USB, you can email it to yourself. If you don't know how to do that, see me during the break. But what I'm going to do at the end of every day, I'm going to take my code. I'm going to put it in the network folder. I'll show you where that is. I'm going to put my code in the network folder. And you can get a copy of my code and how I ended it. Hopefully my code works so that then you can get a copy of it to see if yours didn't. Then when we come back on the following class, if you forgot your USB drive or you just want to start from where I'm starting, I'll give you my code so you can start from where I'm starting. Uh, you'll be able to access this code only in this lab, because you know we need to get people to take these classes. But I'm going to put my code right now in the network folder. Let me show you where the network folder is. Obviously you need to be on one of our computers. Your laptop won't work, unfortunately. But um, go to the desktop. Go to the desktop and then you'll see computer at the top left, open our computer, your computer window. You'll see a bunch of drives here. And one of them is in the network location. Classroom data, drive Z, drive Z. Network location, open classroom data, drive Z. You'll see a bunch of instructors folders in alphabetical order, except for Zach, he cheated. You want to scroll down. And you'll, see, you'll find Campos Android 1. This is the folder where I'm going to be putting stuff for you. Right now, only the syllabus is there. So if you want a digital copy of the syllabus, there it is. Let me put a copy of my work, if you want my file. It's simply called September 8th. So you can drag that to your flash drive. You can copy it to your desktop, email it to yourself as an attachment. But every day, every end of the day, I'm going to put my work in there. So you can get a copy of it if you if you missed it and stuff. So here's my September 8th work. I'll remind you again when we come back on Thursday where this network folder is, but it's on the desktop in the network location, Classroom Data Z, Campus Android 1. There's the work. So we're going to end the main lecture at this point, have a little lab time. You want to make sure that you've properly enrolled, that you've got the add code and used it on the site to add the class, and that you also signed in on the pink sheet right over there. You can sign out if you'd like, or I'll sign you out for you.